Hello, y'all. My name is Dr. Bianca Nightingale Lee, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about um, the Hip Hop Learning Lab, an exploration of curricular development for the lives and literacies of Black boys. So it's a little awkward, right? Um, because I can't have a conversation with you, and what I would like to do is just have a back and forth conversation where we ask questions and things like that. Unfortunately, I'm not able to be face to face with you right now, but we really are still going to have a conversation. Um, my presentation style is very laid back. Um, I keep things real. Um, I was an educator for about 15 years, elementary and middle school. So everything that I do with my research um, nests within teachers. I was an instructional coach for a time. I've had some administration roles, but really teachers are where my heart at. So what I'm going to bring to you today is some of the research that I worked on um, with hip hop and literacy. I am a professor at Florida Atlantic University in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, and I'm really excited to share with you some of the fun things that um, I've been doing with uh, other teachers and admin uh, across this last year. So I'm gonna start off by showing you this embarrassing picture of me. Um, while my sweater vest is dope, <laughs> that's not the main point of this picture. Um, so you see at the bottom it says, by age six, I lost my voice. And that's true. By age six, I did lose my voice. I was um, retained, labeled, and trapped by the age of six. So I was held back in kindergarten. I was told I had a learning disability. Um, I was put in the lowest reading group. So all of these three factors coming together made me feel like I can't learn. Like, why would I even try? Like, if if I was retained and did all these things by six years old, I just never tried in school. So my K through 12 experience was, um, was bleak to say the least. And I did actually lose my voice. Um, I, I, I didn't talk in class. I didn't think I had anything to add. And it's still something that I grapple with today as a grown 40 plus year old woman about finding my voice. And it stems back to what happened in my kindergarten classroom. Voice is the literal expression of one's identity, the echoing of the self. If you can't talk about what you believe in in a way that feels natural, you can become alienated from your inner self. You're no longer able to express who you truly are. I love this quote because it embodies this idea of the power of voice. Right. And so I felt extremely voiceless during my K through 12 experience. And so I have been constantly searching for finding a voice. And this is the same reason I became an educator was to help students not find their voice, but to use their voice. Every student comes into the classroom with a voice. I'm not giving them voice. I'm just allowing them the freedom to use it. Right. So let's not get that misconstrued. I'm not saying that as educators, we give students voice. We just allow and invite that voice to come into the classroom and be a part of an eclectic mix of other voices, right, as we learn together. So Geneva Gay in 2010 said, educators must develop and deliver curriculum and instruction in ways that do not silence the cultural voices of diverse students. And I agree with that. If you look and think about the research, specifically about diverse students, more specifically about black students uh, from the, the, the year 1985 to 2019. There is this, what you see before you is just a very small snippet of all of the works that have been happening, all of the research that we've gathered about what is good for black children, what is good for black students, how do they learn best, what type of instructional um, manifestations work best with them, what type of curriculum works best for them. And yet, specifically our black boys are still very voiceless. For many black male students, the divergence between who they are and the curriculum used to teach them poses an ominous threat as they attempt to reconcile their cultural and racial epistemologies within traditionalized literacy instruction. This is a problem, y'all. 
And, and that's why I, I'm here with you today. I do a lot of work around hip hop and students, but specifically today, we're going to learn a little bit more about um, what I do with black boys and hip hop. So a sister friend in my head who I got the opportunity to meet and talk with on a couple of different occasions is Jamila Lyscott. She is a prolific author, professor, and poet. And so she has a wonderful TED Talk talking about how um, she was articulate. So she has a poem that she recites through this TED Talk. But in addition to that, she has an article um, that came out in 2017. And she starts off the article by asking, we out here fighting for Black Lives Matter in these streets, but do Black Lives Matter in our classrooms? And really, I told you a little bit about my history. I told you where my heart is. <clears throat> my heart is always going to be at the heart of educators. I'm always going to be a teacher. And so this question, do Black Lives Matter in our classroom, keeps bubbling up in my mind. And hopefully if you're watching this, it bubbles up in yours too, because... <laughs> The research and the statistics continuously shows us that no, black lives do not matter in our classrooms. If they did, we would be employing other types of strategies and curricular formats to better support black lives in our classrooms, but we don't. Now, we can conjecture as to why we can talk about the system, we can talk about the district, we can talk about all of these myriad of things as to why this doesn't happen. But at the end of the day, what are we doing in our classrooms to make sure black lives do matter, right? And so what I'm gonna share with you a little bit is um, my attempt working with um, a couple different people across the district, teachers as well as the Office of African and African American Genders, Holocaust and Latino Studies and working on how do we try to answer this question together as a collective? Because it can't just be just Dr. Nayeli. It can't just be one person from the district. It can't just be one educator. It definitely has to be a collective. So uh, the work that you're gonna hear today focuses on authentically created curriculum, which combines student voice, critical literacy, and hip hop culture in an attempt to better understand what curriculum development centered around black boys specifically looks like, sounds like, feels like in an urban middle school setting. So I entitled this, I Get to Choose Curriculum. So it's curriculum that the students help to create. Now, I stop here because it makes me think about all my years as an educator. I was second grade teacher, middle school teacher, of English and social studies, as well as a third grade teacher. And I think for the most part, I mean, I came up with my own curriculum, right? But I don't know how often I allow the students to have input on that curriculum, duh. Like, I don't know how often I was like, what do y'all wanna learn about? I was so stringently tied to the standards or what my principal wanted or, you know, as educators, we have all of these different things kind of coming down on us as to how we need to teach things, what we need to teach, instead of just going to the customer themselves, which is the student. We want the students to learn. Why don't we ask them, hey, what do you want to learn, right? And how do you want to learn that? And really, those are the two really big questions that um, we leaned on in this process. So I call this the I Get to Choose curriculum, uh, and it was grounded by critical hip hop based literacy modules, and it started by an interest survey. So the literacy modules themselves is something that um, I've been working on for uh, a couple of years. I worked back in Louisville, Kentucky with um, an educator by the name of Nyree Clayton Taylor. And so she is a dynamic educator of uh, fifth grade students. And we worked together on creating um, these modules that were hip hop focused, where the primary text was not a basal reader or something out of a you know Pearson based textbook. It was hip hop lyrics, right? Um, and so what we developed together was kind of this idea around um, what it would a literacy module look like? 
And so from that, I took it a step further and really started to break down the literacy module into different levels and different curricular and instructional pillars. And I'll go over that um, right now. So we have level one, which is literary analysis. And so the instructional pillars just talk about um, basically the level and the depth of your instruction. When you think about level one, you're thinking about literary analysis, you're thinking about looking at grammar, you're looking at analyzing text. It's something very basic. We're looking at language. What type of language does the author use in this text? Level two is textual interpretation, where we're digging a little bit deeper into understanding what is the author's purpose, um, what are some of the um, main themes that are coming out of this text. And then level three is textual redesign. Textual redesign is the highest level of, of kind of a Bloom's taxonomy type deal where students are actually taking text, ripping it apart in a sense by dissecting it and analyzing it and then creating their own text um, through redesign. So the curricular pillars, so for the curricular pillars, you have three different pieces here. You have um, you have a hip hop mentor text. So that is as part of the hip hop based literacy modules, every text that you use is going to be a hip hop based text. Now you can um, always pair it with a more traditional literacy text, like a picture book or something like that, or you can bring it back to um, a, a larger theme that is happening in the country. Um, using critical media literacy, anything like that, but the main text that you use is going to be a hip hop text. Um, it was also centered around the nine elements of hip hop, specifically um, the ones that are easily translatable in the classroom are going to be five, and that's going to be emceeing, graffiti, DJing, b boying, and entrepreneurship. And then they're always going to be housed around a critical literacy topic. Now, critical literacy is about pushing students to think critically about their world, to look for power, look for position, look for privilege. So you're asking the students with everything that they read, what is the what is the author trying to impart here? What is the purpose? What voices are missing? Specifically in hip hop, you can easily bring out misogyny, right? Um, oftentimes, Men are the dominant voices in hip hop, and oftentimes they leave out a whole subset of the female voice. And so we can have conversations around that as well. So here is just another um, visual of the different instructional pillars. So you see here level one, level two, level three. And what I provided here is just a more um, tangible way of seeing the lessons that are attached to each part of your instructional levels. So here's where the kind of fun part comes in. We had an interest survey. And so um, there were seven questions and we administered this survey to um, about 30 boys, right? Um, and so here are the questions. Um, the first one was, what would you like to learn in the hip hop learning lab? So again, asking them, hey, what do you want to learn about? This is your time. We come in here once a week. We're here for you to support you, but we also want to know what you like and what you want to learn. Two, in general, what makes school boring for you? Because we want to know what that is and we want to not do it in here, right? Um, <laughs> so even though you're using hip hop, <clears throat> you can still make school boring uh, if you don't fully understand what makes school boring. You know, I can, I can assume what a black young man thinks is boring, but I don't know, I'm a black woman, I don't know. Um, I know what was boring for me in, in middle and elementary school, but I don't know what their reality is. So why not ask them instead of just assuming? Three, what's the best part of school for you? I wanted to know, like, what do you get excited about coming to school every day to do what, to be in what class? And I bet you can kind of guess what classes they wanted to be in every day. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Minute, excuse me. Uh, four, what is the best part about the hip hop learning lab for you? So when we administered this survey, we had been coming in and talking with the students for over about three months, right? Building rapport, having very small lessons. And so we wanted to know, what do you like about our time coming in here? Um, because oftentimes we would come in and the boys would just kind of be like, 
you know, chilling, like, too cool for school, you know, hey, how you doing, Dr. Nightingale, hey, you know, daps and all that stuff. But they weren't really talkative to us. They would talk in their little groups and circles, but they didn't really talk to us. So this survey was kind of like a way of breaking the ice to where, you know, maybe they feel intimidated by me. I was the one of the only, me and one other young lady who I won't mention, but me and one other woman were the only women in an all-male classroom and so maybe you know i intimidate the thing because i'm a girl i don't know so they didn't really talk as much but i know when i'm not in the classroom they talk more so all of that to say i wanted to know what did they like about the hip-hop learning lab and then um what is your favorite subject in school and why so i wanted to know um outside of this class what do you love about learning and what do you love about specific content areas and then um number six is list the name of your favorite hip-hop song and rap artist and this is extremely intentional this i wanted to know because there's a generational gap there's a generational gap so the songs that i like these gentlemen did not necessarily know about or the songs that they like. I had never heard of some of these people. And so I wanted to get kind of a, a repository of the different songs and artists that they like and they listen to. So that was a really, really important question because I can go back to my Tupac and Biggie and my Kanye West and my KRS ones and Benita Applebaum. Okay, that's inappropriate. We won't play that one. But I'm just saying, you know, Tribe Call Quest, I can do that all day. Right, and they'll still, you know, vibe with it. They still like it, but how much more powerful is it if I could take one of the things they listen to every single day and bring it into the classroom, and then we we analyze it in some way, shape, or form. We attach it to our lives, or we we criticalize it in some way. So that was the powerful part. And then um, seven is list two things you worry about on a daily basis. This also wasn't a very intentional question because outside of school. You know, it's oftentimes we, we forget kids have whole lives going on. And there's a lot of mitigating factors that play into how they experience their realities every single day. They come into our classrooms, into our schools every single day. And behind them is a laundry list of stuff that they've had to deal with. Um, and I wanted to know, what is that laundry list? What are some things that you worry about? Because if it's homelessness, if it's, well, I eat tonight, if it's, my mom or dad doesn't have a job, or if it's, I don't know where my father is. <laughs> and I expect you to learn, like, learn too on top of that. I mean, those are real life issues that you cannot separate. We try, well, not we try, but some people try to separate school and home when it's unfathomable. You can't do it. They are one and the same. So bring that in, bring in some of your worries so I can infuse that into a lesson via hip hop and just make this this whole learning experience much more relatable and connected to you. So, <clears throat> um, so here are some of the the answers that I got. So, out of these thirty surveys, we kind of analyze um, um, the the reoccurring um, responses that came up. And so, for question number one, how would you like to learn in the HHL? Um, People said how the beat affects your emotion and how to make beats and how to edit music. So a lot of them were really concerned with how do I create music? They wanted us to bring in beat making machines and things like that, um, in which at the end of our school year, which was going to be this year, we were going to take them into a recording studio to record some of the things that they created. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were unable to do that. Um, but they really were into creation. They wanted to create something, which makes sense, right? Number two, um, in general, what makes school boring for you? A lot of people said the way people teach, um, having tests. Someone else said, uh, or a couple people said homework, and some people said it's too quiet. If you think about traditional schooling, it's predicated on this idea of sitting down, sitting in rows, being quiet, listening to the teacher, extremely traditionalized ways of learning, right? But we have non-traditional students and we're trying to force them in this traditionalized format. It just doesn't work. I mean, that too quiet piece, that makes perfect sense. Why does it have to be so quiet? 
And listen, I was one of the main teachers who was like, you, you need to be quiet. You need to be quiet because I can't hear myself think or you need to be quiet because you're affecting someone else's learning. So I, I get that. I get that. But I'm also questioning, could I have made more of a happy medium there? You know, question three, what is the best part of school for you? Uh, people said lunch. Why? Because they get to socialize and talk and be free and not too quiet, right? Someone said the bus loop or some people said the bus loop. Why? Again, they get to talk, socialize, not be too quiet. Gym, why? They get to talk, socialize, not be too quiet. In the courtyard. These are the four, hmm, these are the four uh, parts of school that they enjoy the most. And we can conjecture as to why. <clears throat> but the bigger question for us as educators is how can we bring some of that energy that they love and they thrive upon, especially in middle school, into the classroom, right? In a, in a, a guided way, of course right but it's good to know that these are the four places that they they love to be in the most but the classroom was never on anyone's list um so what is the best part about the hip-hop learning lab for you um they said when we create our raps rapping in front of our peers and learning about lyrics now question number five um and this is actually question number seven i didn't give you all of the questions but this was the question that um, really kind of shook us to our core when we said list two things you worry about on a daily basis and overwhelmingly these were the answers being poor being homeless my family my future so <clears throat> as a collective group we sat down and thought about if these are the worries and the angst that students are coming in the door with, but yet we're teaching about Shakespeare or some old white person over here who has nothing to do with their reality. Why not make the lessons geared towards who they are in their reality, right? So that's what we try to do um, through the Hip Hop Learning Lab. So, um, if you recall, uh, a lot of the students like to analyze lyrics. Now, analyzing lyrics is kind of the most basic form of um, the literacy modules. Um, it's something that anyone can do. And it's not hard. But what we did, if you kind of look at this page here, you'll see that it's broken down into the lyrics are on one side and then the textual analysis is on the other. So when we do textual analysis, we really look at it through a critical literacy lens and we would do line by line analysis, okay? Um, and we would recognize unknown words, it's kind of a basic thing. We would decode, break down larger concepts and then um, connect ideas to broader concepts or issues we see in our world. Um, and then the final question that we would do when we would analyze the lyrics is, what is the overall message the author is trying to convey through this text? So you'll see here that this is an author, um, and her name is Lauren Hill. Um, a lot of you probably already know her. But when we bring in the hip-hop text, we, we, we use it as, as if it's a, a, a legitimized text, which it is. And we say the author is Lauren Hill, and these are her words. Let's break this down. So we take it line by line by line. Um, so if you read this line by line by line, it starts off by saying the subconscious psychology that you use against me, if I lose control, will send me to the penitentiary. So we, we look at those two lines and we break that down. What is psych subconscious psychology? Why will it send her or our people to the penitentiary, penitentiary, excuse me. And we have a conversation around that. Then we break down a second, such as Alcatraz or shot up like Hajj Malik Shabazz. We talk about what is Alcatraz, who is Hajj Malik Shabazz. Um, and, and looking at the next line, and the fuzz treat bruhs like they manhood never was. And if you're too powerful, you get bugged like Peter Tosh and Molly was. Right? And so we, we break down who those people are, things like that. But the overarching um, theme that we get from this is prison, imprisonment which is a huge issue um, within the black community, right? But even um, in the school to prison pipeline, right? We've all heard of this. And so we bring in statistics like this, like black students represent 40% of all school-related arrests, only make up 18% of the student population in the US. 
I mean, you can bring in mathematics right there and just look at the disproportionate numbers. But what is that saying? What message is that saying to to me as a black woman, to you as black students, us as black people? We have those big, broader conversations. Uh, another um, statistic, students who have been expelled or suspended are two times more likely to drop out. Let me talk about that. Some of the students in there had been suspended. We have conversations about what does suspension mean? Why is suspension bad? Some of the students are like, yeah, suspension, I get out of school. But overall, over the course of your K through 12 experience, if you were suspended this many times, what does that mean for your learning? What does that mean for your outlook? And why are students two times more likely to drop out if they've been expelled or suspended? We have those broader conversations. Next, Latino and black students are twice as likely to not graduate high school as whites. Why would that be? We start to look at the infographic that you see here as well. You can't see all the figures as clearly, but um, we go over that with the students so they know that there is a system created for you. And if you are successful, you go on to college. And if you are not successful, there are other places that you will go. And some of those places may be incarceration. You may be incarcerated if you um, fall into these traps and we have those real conversations um, and the last one black girls are 10 times more likely to be suspended than white girls we ask the question why do you think that would be um, and again it's not didactic in nature where we're telling them this is you know it's not like a scare straight like oh you better get ready because you're about to go to it's not like that it's really i'm going to present you with the facts and we're going to have a conversation about it um, and, and really, that's it's really just about having a conversation over time. Now, let me tell you that it's not easy to have a conversation with boys. I told you, not for me, I, I told you that I would go in once a week with a group of, of team members who we would all go in once a week and we would talk with them. But sometimes they didn't really want to talk. It, it took a while to build that rapport and let them know we're not here to tell you what do we just want to be with you and have conversation and really once that was lifted and they understood our role wasn't to be punitive or judge them or things like that and we just wanted to have conversations things started to liven up and they started to um, share a lot more so um <clears throat> here we looked at um kind of this idea of what is it what does a criminal look like hmm what does a criminal look like? We talked about the school to prison pipeline, right? And now let's talk about what does a prisoner look like? What does a criminal look like? So they came up with this list, sagging pants, they're wearing a hoodie, dark clothes, tattoos, loud grills. They got a crew, they're loitering around different places. They have loud music, dreads, bandanas, a do-rag, they're carrying a weapon. Someone said crip walking, do they crip walk still? I don't know. Uh, flashy clothes, jewelry, hands in pocket, shirtless, white tee, white beater, aka, you know. So we had the conversation around what does a criminal in society look like? And they named all these things. And then we said, how often do you look like this? How often do you wear these type of things? How often are you sagging? How often do you wear a hoodie? How often do you wear dark clothing? How often do you have a cousin or a relative that wears a grill? Um, how often do you wear a do-rag? I mean, uh, Dr. Nanya Lee wears a do-rag every night. I mean, so we started having even broader conversations around, this is how society views criminals, and yet this is what I wear on a daily basis. Does that make me a criminal? Am I, am I a criminal now? And the answer is undoubtedly no, you are not a criminal, right? But it, it, it still hits home this idea of how how they see us when they see us, right? When they see us and they see the sagging and the loud music and the wife beater and all of these different things, people associate that with criminal. Is that right or wrong? We had conversations about that as well. Um, so whether it's right or wrong, we know it's wrong. But the reality is that is the way in which they see us. So it's very important to know how you are stepping out into the world and how people are going to view you based on that. It's, it's just a heightened level of awareness of, of where they are as black men in the U.S. in 2020. Um, so uh, another part of the survey, if you remember, one of their words was being broke. <clears throat> a lot of them are worried about not having enough money to take care of their family. 
um, not having enough money to put food on the table, not having enough money to support their moms. Moms were, were a big thing that kept coming up. Like, I got to take care of my mom. I got to take care of my mom. A lot of the boys in the class um, didn't have a strong relationship with their father. And so they felt they had to take on that male presence, that male role. So being broke is something that we focused on by looking at uh, it through a hip hop lens. So we looked at it through to become a hip hop artist and create a song. Everyone plays a role. So we think about Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar is a rapper, um, but he's also a songwriter. So a rapper gets paid for actually performing the song, but then the songwriter gets paid as well. On top of that, you have an executive producer and a manager who both get uh, $25,000 and then a beat maker um, who creates the beat him or herself. And they get $15,000. So we started thinking about this idea of economics with hip hop and how it is really a, a really big business if you, um, once you get into it and there are different roles that everyone plays. And so what was so interesting about this is that as we started talking about um, the different roles, the students didn't really recognize like, oh, there, there are different roles that people play and they both, they all get paid. They just thought the rapper got everything like, no, no, no. You know, if you have good uh, vocabulary skills, if you're an excellent writer, you can be a songwriter. And you don't ever have to produce or perform anything and you can make money via hip hop, right? Um, so we again, again, broke it down to Kendrick Lamar and um, one of his songs called DNA. And so we talked about, and we made, we, we um, purposely named the different people who were part of his production team. So Kendrick Lamar was the vocals and the songwriter. White, Mike Will Made It was the song producer. Matt Schaefer was the guitarist. Derek Ali, 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 excuse me, I can't talk, was the mixer. Um, Tyler Page was the mixing assistant. And then Cyrus was also a mixing assistant. So we started thinking about, whoa, Hip-hop is multifaceted. It's not just what you see in front of you. And then we could have taken a step further. I didn't think about this when you create videos. The videos that we consume have a whole team behind them and everybody gets paid doing that. So we could have brought that into, but we didn't. Um, we also talked about um, them creating their own songs, right? So after we go over that there are different parts to creating a hip hop song. There's the producer, the songwriter, um, the actual rapper, him or herself. <clears throat> we gave students um, the task of creating their own hip hop team where one person had to be the rapper, one person had to be the songwriter, one person had to be the mixologist or the producer, right? Um, we also talked about this idea of critique and constructive criticism. We said that once they create their raps, um, there's going to be feedback and collaboration in order to make your rap better. Oftentimes, as you know, students write something like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. No, 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 no. I mean, very rarely do rap artists just write something off the dome and it's perfect. They go through the process of revising and editing over and over and over again. They let other people hear it, they get feedback. And that's what we really wanted to impart on our students is that you have to listen to feedback, you have to revise and you have to edit, you have to make things better, right? <clears throat> so what we did was we watched this video right here. I don't know if you're gonna be able to hear it or if it's even gonna play, um, but I hope it works. So, oh, I don't know if you can hear this, I don't know how the recording works, but this is from a show called Songland, Songland, sorry. it's from a uh, show called Songland, and in this show, what happens is, um, 
you have recording artists and I don't know if you saw in the, the previous frame, it was the Jonas Brothers. And so they are looking for a new song to produce and actually put out as a, as a record. And so they have on this song land, they have three different artists come in who write and produce their own songs and they perform it in front of the, the recording artist and the recording artist choose the one that's best. And so in order to do that, as you're seeing here, you see this gentleman walking around and doing his little thing, right? His, his, his song is called The Green Light. And so he's performing it for them. What happens towards the latter part of the performance is that he stops and then a whole team of people give him constructive criticism and feedback. I highly recommend this specific um, um, video to show students that writing is a process creating a song is a process it's not a one and done type thing it's definitely something that has to happen over time and you refine and you revise and you make your work great it's not necessarily going to be perfect but your very first writing is a rough draft right and you bring in different collaborators and thought um thought people to think about your work and make it better and and so we know that for so many of our students um it's so tough for them to even take criticism right it's so tough for them to take criticism they don't want to hear i did anything wrong it's not about wrong or right it's just about making things better it's about making improvements and so that's what we want to impart by doing that um <clears throat> so here was the task that students had to do they had to pick a role like i said before either songwriter rapper producer manager beat maker write a stanza based on their knowledge of self knowledge of self was a whole nother unit that we did prior to this unit um, where they learned about um, kind of the Afro-historic nature of hip-hop and how it relates to who they are right now and things like that. Um, they had to find a beat for their stanza. They had to perform their song, including ad-libs. And the winning song got a special prize. And the special prize was a recording contract. And really, it was just like some rap snack chips, right? And so they all had to do this so they got into little groups and they they doled out these roles and i promise you once we gave them once we set the platform for what they had to do we, we gave them all of these parameters they took it and ran with it we didn't have to help them with anything and they came up with some of the most phenomenal work you'd ever want to see and they all played their part right um, they presented in front of uh our team and we gave them constructive criticism. They went back and did it over again. And then we did have a winner who won the rap snacks, which was kind of cool. Um, we gave them a scale. Uh, we gave them a rubric on how they were going to be assessed. So it was kind of like an American Idol type thing. But we said uh, quality of knowledge of self, uh, quality of your beat, quality of the performance, quality of teamwork and cooperation, and quality of dedication to the process. So. The quality of knowledge yourself and quality of beat were kind of the hip hop layers to this. We wanted to also bring in um, the social skills, quality of teamwork and cooperation. Now, they could have had the most bomb song in the world. But if we notice that you were not cooperating and you were not being a team player in that team, then you got marked down for that. Also, quality of dedication to the process. As usual, you had some students that were really into it, like, I'm, I'm in this, I'm in it, I really want to learn more, I want to do better on getting constructive criticism and feedback. And there were some students that, again, were too cool for school who were just like, eh, you know. And so we met, we marked them down for that. And we told them, like, the reason that your scores are not this, this, or this is because one team member wasn't quite part of the team. And then we had discussions on how they can make that better, right? Um, but I mean, again, it came from a real place. We weren't going to color or cookie candy code any of this. It was just, this is what it is. Um, quality performance. This is about, you know, that tapped into public speaking and, and listening. And, and so when you got up to present, were you just standing, looking down, rapping? Rah, 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 or were you engaging with the audience? Were you moving your hand? Were you making gestures? Were you letting the music fuel through you? Um, all of those things place into your performance and so how well that went. Um, and so all of those things all together really made a really nice um, lesson for the students. Uh, they were excited about what they were doing. They actually presented this to um, people outside of the classroom. So that was pretty dope as well. 
Okay, so something else that they that came out of the student survey was family. They were really worried about family and what does that mean? And so we had a whole unit on brotherhood. What is the definition of brotherhood? Why it's important and what does it take to be in a brotherhood? So again, I had a team of people with me, including two gentlemen, three gentlemen who kind of helped um, us talk about brotherhood because while I do believe in brotherhood and while I do believe it's super important, I feel like there's great power in using black males to talk about black male issues. And brotherhood is one of those things that I can't fully speak to. So I allowed other people um, to to speak with me and through me uh, for this portion. But brotherhood uh, was really about this idea of in groups, how can we show that we are brothers? What does it mean to be a brother? If a, if a brother is down, what do we do to lift them up? What do we do for that, right? And so for this activity, um, we had them create brotherhood groups. So they had to come up with a group name. They had to come up with a mission statement. So what does your brotherhood really stand for? They had to come up with role models. So who is your role model? Collectively in your group, who are the people that you idealize, that you that you look up to, that really um, inspire you? Um, and then they had to have a logo. So what how do you what symbol are you going to use to represent who you are? And then a rap hook or a rap stanza or some sort of rap that represented who they were. This was challenging for um, the boys on a lot of different levels. Um, so when we just gave them this uh, activity to do, they were kind of like, eh, I don't get it. So we went a little bit further um, and we watched a YouTube video. I don't know if this is going to play. Um, So this video, I hope you can hear it and see it, is um, a video of a group called the Brotherhood, right? Very appropriately named. And so as you can see, hopefully you can see, the Brotherhood is a dancing group, right? And so they are in sync, they're synchronized, they have gone through clearly lots of planning, and they have to um, respond and and support each other in order to get all of these dances done in the most beautiful way possible, right? So we had conversations about what does that mean as the as the dancing brotherhood, what does that mean? What did they have to do in order to really be brothers? And so from that, that kind of spurred conversation about what it means to be a collective and to care about someone else and really about this idea of love. You know, it's 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 kind of passe and cliche to talk about love and boys because they don't really want to talk about, I don't know how to talk about love. But after we really started to look at this video and some of the black brothers who were with me started sharing their ideas around brotherhood and love, the boys started to open up and share um, what family meant to them, what brotherhood meant to them. And so uh, this is a video of them watching um, the brotherhood um, video. Uh, and this is, is something else. Um, J. Cole is someone we used a lot of. Um, so we took out a little bit of, just a little bit of his words. And what we did is we, we read all this and we broke it down into three different stanzas and talked about what does brotherhood mean to J. Cole and how do we know that, right? And so I won't go all, over all of this with you, but... Um, it starts off by saying, I'm dead in the middle of two generations. I'm little bro and big bro all at once. Just left the lab with me on 21 Savage. I'm about to go and meet Jacob for lunch. So we had a conversation about what does that mean he's in the middle of two generations? And they came up with he's he is the little brother of, of like Jigga, Jay-Z. And then he's the big bro to 21 Savage, which means he's giving him advice, but also he's learning from Jay-Z. He's in the middle. And so what does that mean about brotherhood? So we had conversations around that as well. 
And then again, overall, what is the author trying to say through this piece about brotherhood, about family, about who he is? Um, and then how can you take what he is saying, what J. Cole is saying, and apply it to your own life? And so um, something I didn't mention before is that they also had writing journals that they got to write in. So while some gentlemen weren't as apt to, to speak out loud, they were able to write down some of their feelings. And it's um, a journal that we kept with us and we brought back every every time we saw them so they could build on their writing. Um, so they were having some issues with the, the posters themselves. And so we did an example and a non-example, right? And so for the group name, someone came up with Killers for Life. That's, that's you know, we, we want to promote positivity, you know, so I, so we do this, I get to choose curriculum, right? And so you get to choose some stuff, but when you choose something that is derogatory or things like that, we had to pull them back. And that's kind of what this example is all about. It's just like, we gave them the latitude to do things on their own, but when they went a little bit too far left, we just had to bring them back to the center and center why we're doing this and the purpose of it. Um, mission statement. Some of them didn't understand what a mission statement was, rightfully so. They don't write mission statements all the time. So we went over that. Um, we said a good mission statement is, we believe that through hard work and dedication, all things are possible. We pledge to do our best to support our fellow brother. A now example would be, we pledge to eat hot fries every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So some students were very much fans of hot fries. And so they're like, that's our mission statement. Like, nope, that's that's not going to be it. Because mm -mm. got, it's got to be something you can stand on. So a lot of it was also about platforming ourselves as proud individuals. Do you want to be proud standing on hot fries? How proud, how proud can you be on hot fries? Right? And so we would have those conversations too, and they'd be like, yeah, yeah. And here's what we got a little bit. We had kind of some pushback. So I said that an example of role models would be your mom, your dad, LeBron James, J. Cole. And I said a non-example would be Extension. And so... I said he was not a good role model because he got killed and he was in a lot of mess. But the gentleman informed me that he turned his life around, so therefore he would be a good role model because he was in that life, but he has since turned his life around, even though he got murdered. Um, we had kind of a back and forth conversation about that. And I was like, okay, you have made it make sense to me. I understand your thinking. Let him be a role model and for the reasons that you've told me. And then a logo. The logo or the, the example, the good example is brotherhood with two men holding hands. The bad example is smoke with me in a blunt. Yeah, we don't want that, right? And so some of this is facetious, right? And you want to make light of it. But some students were coming up with these type of things. <clears throat> um, so we wanted to nip that in the bud to make sure that their brotherhood posters were of quality and things that they could be proud of. So here is um, a picture of them, and you see um, one of the DOP students from Florida Atlantic there. Um, again, this is uh, just an example of what we showed the gentleman. And so um, when you think about the significance of what this does, and you think about hip-hop, you've got to think about hip-hop as a different type of coded communication. It's a coded communication that speaks to the lives, the literacies, and the interests of black and brown students. Um, they listen to it every single day. They love it. They recite the lyrics. It's a part of their being. It's a part of who they are. So the significance of bringing hip hop inside of the classroom is so profound because you are now connecting classroom to home. You are, what we've done with the survey was connect some of their home worries to classroom content, right? Um, we, didn't, we didn't harp on, oh, we know some of you guys are homeless and so we're going to talk about economics now. No, it wasn't like that. It was just like, hey, everyone wants to be aware of how to make money through hip hop. This is how you can make it, right? We talked about the different things that you need in order to get a job as a producer and things like that. Right. And so the significance of this is when you start to platform hip hop over um, um, texts that are canonized and things like that, 
that are that are standardized. You start to platform hip hop and it gives students another avenue of success. Like you're reflecting back to them who they are and they love that, right? The engagement that you receive when you do this type of work is just, it's ridiculous, right? Um, and let me start by saying I am not an expert by any means. This is something that I researched specifically hip hop with elementary school students. Um, and that's kind of what you see here. You see pictures of elementary school students doing this work. Um, but really it's a collective. In order to answer Jamila Lightscott's question of do black lives really matter in our classrooms? It's gonna take things like this. It's gonna take new ways of thinking about curriculum and instruction and making the classroom not too quiet, making it a little bit loud to bring in the voices of the students to make sure that their voices are being heard. And so they, they can they can soar and they can, they can shine in the classroom. Really, that's what it's about. Um, so I feel like hip hop is a way of fostering this kind of black intellectualism. Right. Um, it's centering criticality in hip hop literacies in the urban classroom allows students to recognize that their background and culture are just as relevant and worthy of study as those of the students whose cultural identities are traditionally represented in the classroom literature. This is by Lauren Kelly, 2013, who is also a professor and uh, a hip hop researcher as well. Um, and so that's really what this work is about. What I've shared with you today is um, is real work. It's not it's not anything like super polished. It's really the kind of collective work that I think we all need to do as we start to forge new pathways of success for black and brown students. It's going to be messy at first, but the benefits are going to be unparamount, you know, um, and so. I hope that what you gleaned from this presentation was just a tiptoe into some of the different ways that you can bring hip hop and critical literacy into your classroom. Um, I wanna keep talking about this. I will talk about this all day. So I'd love to work with you at your school, whether you're an administrator or a teacher, um, hit me up. I am at Florida Atlantic University. I am a professor in the department of curriculum and instruction. My contact information is down here. Um, I look forward to, to talking further with you about this conversation. If you have ideas like, hey, Bianca, I do this in my classroom. This is how I do it. Man, that's what, that's what I would love to talk to you about. I am new to the Florida area. I've only been here for about two years. Um, so I'm eager to tap into um, hip hop heads or people who just wanna try this out in their elementary, middle or high school classroom to just think about new ways of curriculum and instruction. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more, I didn't want to put a whole bunch of resources on here, but um, the Get Free curriculum, there's the link there. Um, it's a multimedia hip hop civics curriculum and its goal is to introduce students to a national network of activists for social change. So if you are into looking at hip hop to for social action, that is where you would want to go. Because in this curriculum, and I will say that Dr. Bettina Love helped to create all of this curriculum, excuse me, but in this curriculum, it's just crazy because you have syllabi that is hip hop based and social activist based. You have videos of, of speeches where people are thinking about social change you have lessons, you have textbooks, you have a whole myriad of resources um, to think about how to embed hip hop for social change. It is just a very dynamic, um, user-friendly place to go if you want to dig into some more of this, especially for the middle high school arena. Now, I talked um, a little bit about Jamila Lyscott. Her um, website is just jamilalyscott.com. And so she, um, has a lot of resources on there as well about hip hop and then specifically language. A lot of her work is centered around language and how do we 
discriminate against students by not allowing their language to come into the classroom. Remember, we spoke before about voice, allowing students' voice to be heard in the classroom. Hers, her focus is a lot about um, languages and what type of languages we allow in the classroom, what languages we don't, and overall, what does that mean? So she is the one who asked the questions, do black lives matter in our classrooms, right? That's the, that's the big question that Jamila always asks. Um, and uh, I hope that through this lesson and all that you've learned through the symposium, you are better equipped to answer that question with a yes. Again, if you want to talk more about this, holler at me. Thank you for your time. I hope you have a great day. Bye.